Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. I'm Andrew Musgrove and today we're joined by our Chief Newcastle United writer, Lee Ryder. Whether you're joining us from, please subscribe or follow and share the episode. Coming up today, we're going to look back on Newcastle United's season so far, the European adventures, St James's Park becoming the fortress and of course the curse of the injuries. Plus what, if anything, Newcastle United can do in the transfer market. Let's get on with the show. Lee, thanks for popping on to the podcast. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we're here to do half-term report of the season so far. Newcastle United 10th after 21 games out of Europe, out of the League Cup, still in the FA Cup. Um, before we go into a bit more depth about things, just sum up the season so far through your eyes. Well, I don't think it's what we expected in pre-season. Uh, you know, I was with with the squad in America and um, there was a lot of optimism in the air over what could be achieved. And and to be fair, the, the start of the season, um, you know, once they got over that little hiccup in August, um, it was pretty steady, um, you know, right up until um, probably, I would say, the Champions League defeats against Dortmund uh, was probably the first time that I felt that something wasn't quite right. And then you had injury after injury um, after that. And yeah, I think it's probably a disappointment compared to last season. Um, but given the injury crisis, I think it's been, it's been tough. It's been tough for Eddie Howe. It's been tough for the squad. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a difficult season so far, but, I still think there's something they can salvage from uh, from what's left. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think once they start getting players back, Joe Willicks just posted on his Instagram, funny enough, that he's back in the gym. Matty, Matty Target was at the end of the, the line of bikes as well. So hopefully by the time they start getting a few players back over the next month, six weeks, I do think they can finish the season strongly. And the fact they're out of Europe and they'll only be playing um, weekend to weekend is, is probably a benefit to them in, in a strange way where they can hopefully pick up a few points and get back up the table. But we have to start with the injuries. It's the only place we can start because I was writing the list down uh, prior to, to recording the show and I was asking our colleague Aaron Stokes to write, who's out long term? And I named three or four. And then he said, you're forgetting this fella, you're forgetting this fella. And my mind has been absolutely blown at the list of names I've got written down. So still out, Joe Willick, Elliot Anderson, Harvey Barnes, Jacob Murphy, Matt Target and Nick Pope. We've had injuries to Callum Wilson, who is out. We've had injuries to Alexander Isak, Dan Byrne, Sven Botman, Joe Linton, who is out, and Sean Longstaff. I maybe even have missed a couple. The list, Lee, is unbelievable. It, the bad luck they've had, I mean, how would you get your head around it? Yeah, I think at one point someone published a, a team picture of, you know, an injured 11, treatment room 11, you know. Uh, I've known, I've covered Newcastle a long time and I've known nothing like this. I, you know, Glenn Roder had a really tough time. I, I think he had 12, 12 injuries out all at the same time. People like Michael Owen, Emery, Scott Parker. Uh, he had a, he, there was a goalkeeping crisis thrown in there as well at that point. I think that was 2006, 2007. And I'd never known anything quite like that since then. This has been even worse than that. Um, this has been unbelievable. This is uh, this has been like a full full team out, as I say. You know that I think ball mouth away when Bruno was suspended um, and Lewis Miley came in. That was kind of the the, the start of what's been just an unbelievable run of injuries and. I think obviously questions have been asked at the training ground. Why is this happening? Um, if you remember Graham Souness back in the day moved the team down to the academy because he thought it was he thought it was the pitches. Um, he thought it was a problem with injuries from that point of view. So I don't know. I don't, don't quite know how they get to the bottom of it, but the injuries are starting to clear up. You've just mentioned there Joe Willick and Matt Target. Um, you know, suggest, suggesting that they're going to be back sooner rather than later uh, and there's a couple more you throw in there but yeah I've, I've never I've never seen anything quite like this before the key one for me though is probably Nick Pope because the way Newcastle play um, he's very integral to that and I like Martin Dubravka but he's a different sort of goalkeeper um, probably more of a shot stopper really but I think Nick Pope has that tendency to sort of rush out a bit yes he has made a few mistakes when he's done that. Um, but 
I think it's just the way Newcastle play. If you remember that banner last season, the, the four defenders who were picked in pretty much every game and Nick Pope, that was the defensive rear guard. That was one of the big foundations for success last season. And Nick Pope has been a really bad miss for Newcastle. And um, that, for me, is the key. Well, you could make a case for any of them, I know. But for me, if I had to pick one, I'd say that's where it started going wrong when Nick Pope got injured. Yeah, again, I, I agree with you. I think he's he probably doesn't get the credit he deserves in many ways for the way he helps organise that back line. He definitely seems to be the the, the missing ingredient of, of late, as well as Martin Dubravka has done in the last two or three games. And you're right, the, the speed he comes off his line is something Martin Dubravka just doesn't have. We saw in that Spurs game when Dubravka hesitated. You, you know, you, you would think Nick Pope would be straight there uh, to deal with it. Do you? Think, uh, Lee, that the amount of injuries they've picked up does it insulate how slightly, given the bad run he's on? Obviously, outside pressure, media down in London, um, you know, pushing say Jose Mourinho towards the job, definitely hype, heaping pressure on Eddie Howe. But you've got to, you know, he's got credit in the bank for last season, and then you have to take in the sheer amount of injuries Newcastle have had this season, and it, and it does offer him some respite from, from the pressure, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, it is a huge factor. Um, and I know he's, you know, we've got a norm over the last couple of years. Uh, and I know that's something that he doesn't want to use as an excuse. Um, the only thing I would say is that probably if you look at the team sheet, for, let, let's just say the last seven games, six defeats from seven in the Premier League. If you look at the team sheet for each of them games, I do think that there was enough quality on there to get a result. Um, I'm probably thinking of the game against Luton, the game against Nottingham Forest. I think that's six points that was easily, you know, thrown away. I mean, I, I still can't get over the Nottingham Forest game, how good Chris Wood was, or was he made to look that good? I don't know. You know, going into that game beforehand, if you'd said to me, Chris Wood's probably going to score today, I'd have said, yeah, you will give him the tap in. But the two goals where he looks like Lionel Messi and just waltzes through and delicately... Lifts it over the keeper. You just can't compensate for that. But, you know, it's got to be about Newcastle. It's got to be about what's on the team sheet for them. And I think the players have had at their disposal, despite the injuries, probably will feel they could have got a lot more um, from those those seven games. And even if you even if you added six or seven points on what they've got now, they're in a European position, which is crazy to think, but that's, that's where they would be. So... Um, I do have sympathy on the injury front, um, but again, it's results. It's a results-driven game, and I think Eddie knows that better than any, anybody, and that's probably why he's so frustrated at the minute. Given the run they're on at the moment, they've lost eight of the last ten games in all competitions. They've got the FA Cup coming up next, and then three winnable games on paper: Luton. Bournemouth, Forest, but then we have to remind ourselves of you as you've just done there, Lee. You know they've been beaten by those three teams. You know those three teams collectively picked up nine points against Newcastle. Is Eddie Howe under pressure, or does he become under pressure if those next few games in the Premier League don't go the way um, or don't go in his favour? Well, you know I have written this um, in a couple of pieces I've done already, and it gets a mention in the piece that I've got going up later on this afternoon at four o'clock. And you do mention that batch of games, Luton, um, Bournemouth and Nottingham Forest. And I think those three games are going to be critical to everything, really. The season, anyhow, ev everything. Because if, I mean, Aston Villa away is going to be tough. And I don't like writing games off, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Eddie Howe doesn't either. Um, but you almost... Not forgive them, but you know, you almost say, Well, that's not a surprise result because Aston Villa have had an amazing season. Um, and they're right up there. Um, FA Cup, I don't believe he's getting judged on winning the cup. It would be nice, but I don't think he's getting judged on that. But those three games we just mentioned there, he's got to get six or seven points from those those games. He won't need to be told that. Um, and if he does get six or seven points going into springtime. I think we're all feeling a lot better about everything at Newcastle United. And I think those games are certainly winnable as well. Um, you know, Luton at home, we, we certainly owe them one from losing down there. Um, Nottingham Forest away again, you know, can 
Is Chris Wood going to go and have another game like that? Is he going to get another hat trick? I don't think so. I think that one's there to be there for the taking almost. And then Bournemouth at home, uh, very winnable. So I'm pretty confident about those three games that they can get something from them. Fingers crossed they can pick up uh, maximum points would be the, the dream. And of course, uh, a couple of them games at home as well, where they are so good. We, we've mentioned that the run that they went on kind of before Christmas, um, on Boxing Day, of course, with, with Nottingham Forest. And I think the glaring issues, Lee, of late has been the in the midfield, the gap between the midfield and the defence. And we've seen, we saw Kevin De Bruyne exploit it when he came off the bench on uh, against City on Saturday. But we saw Forrest do the same. We saw Ross Barkley do the same uh, for Luton. Do you think that can be solved in, in, over the next couple of weeks? Newcastle have got a break. I know the players are, are heading off on their respective holidays around the world. Um, but c- how easy is it, Ferdy, how to, to now get on the training pitch and solve the issue, which is so glaring? Yeah, well, it's, it's that number six question again, isn't it? I mean... When Bruno first signed in January 2022, everyone says, "Oh, we've got we've got a number six now." But as it turns out, he's not really a number six; he's more of a number eight. And I believe he wants to get even further forward. Um, then we signed Tenali in the summer. We all know what happened there. He can't play, so we still haven't got a number six. So, you know, we mentioned Calvin Phillips; um, he'd be a player that could do that. Um, but that position, I mean, that Man City game. The Rodri passed through the middle and, and the ball goes past the three midfielders who all ran out to try and get the ball. Um, and it just exposes that big area, which has got number six written all over it. And there's nobody there. So it's something that they do need to address, really, um, going into the last two weeks of the window. I don't know how they do it because of the financial fair play. Everyone seems to be frightened to sign a player now uh, because of these crazy rules. Um, could they get someone in on loan? I hope they can. Could there be a bit of wheeling and dealing to do? Somebody leaves. Can they raise money um, just to balance the books a bit and get a number six? And I think if they did just get someone to, to come in and sit, then I, I think that would be would make a big difference really how. I asked him after the uh, Man City game, you know, are you going to have a player on board for that Aston Villa game? Because if you don't, there's only 48 hours of the window left. He said, my intention will be to do that. But sitting here now, I can't say that I will. So it, it's going to be difficult. But that, that is the, the key area. Everybody knows it. And um, they need to get that one filled somehow. Interesting. Every time or in recent weeks, Eddie Howe has been asked about it, he's kind of played it down. Is, do you think he's doing that because actually he's very aware of what, what the team needs, but also he doesn't want to show his hand to potential selling clubs or potential clubs who could loan him that number six. Yeah, potentially. And, and I think as well, while he doesn't want to make injuries an excuse, he doesn't want to be banging on the door for money to spend every five minutes as well. He's had a lot of money to spend. We'll have to factor that in, if we're being, if we're being totally honest. He's had more money than any Newcastle manager has had to spend um, in recent times, and by the way, you know Steve Bruce did he did get a few quid to spend at, at one point. Uh, Rafa, you know, got players at times. He got little bits of bobs to spend, but Eddie's had a lot of money, and I, and I don't think he wants to continually be demanding more. I mean, you can't really compensate for the Sandro Tonali situation. It's just so it's such a freak incident, um, and that that is that and the Harvey Barnes injury. You know, that dented Newcastle's all the prospects this season based on two bits of business in the summer. One injured, one banned. Either one of them back on the team would make a big difference. So I don't think Eddie wants to, you know, look at it too much about banging on the door for money. Um, but yeah, they, they need that number six. Um, where they get it from, I don't know. Um, it's going to be tough. I mean, Isaac Hayden's been mentioned. Um, but there's two goalkeepers on the bench the other day ahead of him. It feels like his future's definitely an end at Newcastle. So, yeah, it's a, it's one where Eddie will want to do it his way. He's done everything else his way. He'll want to continue doing it. And I guess Newcastle United has uh, been real stickless for the rules and, and adhering to the financial fair play uh, uh, rules. Like you say, you look at what else, what, what is happening elsewhere with Forest, with Everton, with potentially Manchester City and Chelsea down the line. 
it, it, it's frustration it's frustrating as it is not to see them spending a load of cash you can totally understand why they're doing it because they don't want them charges to come and bite them three or four years down the line you know and also by being sensible now come the summer it allow them to 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 maneuver and hopefully get in maybe three or four top quality players yeah i think the summer landscape's a lot different to, to where we are now and you know we all we all look forward to it um hopefully see newcastle make those three or four additions there'll be players off the wage bill there'll be champions league money in in the pot um you've got the adidas deal you've got the seller deal there's so there's so much to look forward to and we can't we can't lose track of the bigger picture um the, where newcastle are at the minute is a difficult spot but moving forward hopefully things can be a lot better and uh this season, we just got to, as I say, we just got to try and salvage something from it. There's still things to play for. Uh, it's going to be tough, but there's still there's still something to, you know, pull from the fire almost. Um, let's hope they can do it. But the summer, that could be, you know, a real, a really exciting one as a journalist, as a fan. Uh, something to look forward to. And I guess if your castle don't get European football, I mean, I think. A lot of people are already writing off Champions League qualification, but you know they're still within a shout of of the lesser European trophies, and that w- would be a great adventure in itself. Is it a big loss to Newcastle if they don't get European football in terms of what they can offer potential arrivals and also what they can say to the likes of Bruno and, Bruno and Isaac who've made their Champions League aspirations clear? Or, as I've seen some people suggesting, Lee, it clears the schedule for them next season to maybe go on a, a cup run without the, the pressure of playing another uh, midweek game in Europe. And it also potentially allows them, if they get the right additions in the summer, to maybe even, I'm going to say it very quietly, launch a title chase. Well, that would be nice. Um, I mean, look, I think the 95-96 season, there was no European football uh, involved. And that that made a big big difference for Kevin Keegan. Uh, they didn't get in Europe 94-95. And... You know, they were able to push on without that distraction. Now, having sat here and I'm like you, um, we, we love being in Europe, you know what I mean? We love the excitement of the draw, um, looking at flights and things like that. You want to be in Europe, really. Um, but by the same token, there's, there's positives of not being in it. But after 20 years of not having it, to suddenly get that little taste of it again, uh, which we got, and then for it to be taken away, I think that w- that would be tough. I, I would love to think we can still get into one of the other two competitions. They are difficult because you're playing on Thursday nights um, and things like that. But it's probably better to be in Europe than not be in Europe, I think. And plus, there's the money side of it. The Europa League, it's not the big um, cash flow you'd get as a Champions League, but it, it's still worth winning. It's still worth pushing for. There's money to be made and... You can also get in the Champions League if you win the Europa League. So I would love to see us somehow get in Europe this season. If we do, then it's been a job well done. Um, And even though it would be almost moving backwards a little bit from finishing fourth, given the injuries, it would be an absolutely wonderful season for Eddie Howe if he can at least say, look, I've got you in the top six. I think that would be a massive achievement for him. Yeah, definitely, like you say, considering that there was injuries. I just want to ask you, on the injuries again, what is the feeling within the camp? I mean, obviously, this week we've seen uh, whispers about Joe Linton and he's going to have to be uh, uh, assessed further before we know exactly what, what what's happening with him, but he potentially could miss the rest of the season. I mean, if you're Eddie Howe and Jason Tyndall, you, you must just be laughing, because if you don't, you'll just end up crying. Yeah, you, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't make it up, as you say, I think. Joe Linton, I mean, there's there's still been nothing official from the club that he is out for the season. Um, so it is worth worth taking that into consideration that I'm pretty sure he'll be fighting to try and get back as, as quickly as he can. Uh, it's not looking good because um, Eddie Howe's already declared him at least out for six weeks. But it's um, I was speaking to people close to him um, in the build-up to, to this podcast, funny enough, and... You know, there is no definitive, he's definitely out for the season until he has all the assessments needed. But look, 
even a losing for six weeks is bad enough. We've missed them all in games already this season. So important in Newcastle, you know, that that game against Norwich where you end up getting dropped back in the midfield, we really was the making of him. And I think ever since then, he's been an integral part of Newcastle United. Huge part of last season. Uh, we've missed him when he hasn't played this year. And, you know, he brings goals to the table as well. He's, you know, he's a big presence when he plays in midfield. He can bring something to the front three. Um, he wins everything in the air. And he just hates losing, you know. And I, I love that about him. And I think if you could probably sum this season up as a GIF, if you go on Twitter, type in Joe Linton on a GIF. There's, I think it was against PSG when the, the penalty uh, got conceded. And it's just Joe Linton just shaking his head. I think if you could sum this season up on a GIF, that would be it for me. Yeah, that's probably how Eddie Howe was feeling because you were going into that Sunderland game thinking, who else could they possibly lose? And then, you know, they lose Joe Linton and then... Like you said, we ju you just could not make it up. Uh, you, you you referenced uh, earlier Lee, the Sandro Tonali ban. I mean, he came to Newcastle United. It caught many people off guard. You know, he's one of the best young midfielders about it. Team Newcastle got a huge bargain, and obviously, then the news transpires um, of these uh, betting offences, and he's out till August next year. Again, it's just another one you you, you couldn't make up. And alongside, as you see, the Harvey Barnes injury, Newcastle have brought in two players at a high cost who they would have seen as first team members, you know, and and taken them up to the next level. And then they've not been able to use them. I mean, again, it's just something that you could not make up. Yeah, I mean, the Tenali one, you know, my, I, I feel that the punishment is harsh. Um, it's too long. Um, and I think... You know, been trying to do some research in and around it. Tried to talk to the Italian football authorities. You know, when's he going to be able to play again? Um, it's, we know he's going to be able to play again next season, but when's he even going to be able to play friendly? They seem to be reluctant to give you that information. Um, Eddie Howe made it clear when it first happened that it's not good for the player to not not be able to play games. Small sided games are are going to change a player's. Is his whole body output, do you know what I mean? So for me, I think the sooner he gets back up and running again, playing, um, the better. Hopefully he's got some exciting chapters to come in his career. I do think he'll feel indebted to Newcastle for sticking by him. Um despite it being harsh. I mean, obviously it wasn't um it wasn't good for him personally, but he seems like a really good character, um, in terms of you know, nice lad. You know, wanted to come to Newcastle, wanted the challenge, um, and just hopefully he can uh, get back on track. But this season for him to not, you know, it's it's January now. We're still going to be another eight months without him on the pitch. It feels like a long time for for what it was. Um, but that that's 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 gone now. They've got to move on from it. Harvey Barnes again to see. We've seen him in pre-season, first game of the season against Villa. Um, scoring a goal, and um, that you know, getting him back is going to be such a boost. I seen him running, running the other day at the training ground. Got his boots back on. He's not far away, so that that's going to be a huge lift for Newcastle as well. So let's just hope that um, he can get a couple of wins, and we'll all feel better uh, once once to get back on um, winning ways in the Premier League. Do you think the impact of the injuries hurts a little bit more when the club think, you know, Harvey Barnes is close to getting back, Joe Willick is close to getting back, and then all of a sudden, oh, they've had a setback? Because that's happened for quite a few players, and it must just be another punch in the gut for Eddie Howe and the staff, and the players, of course, when they are so close to returning to action, but then all of a sudden they're another three, six weeks away from actually returning. Yeah, and... and players are very sensitive about setbacks. I've seen it down the years. Someone's working so hard, then they get back on the pitch and then it gets just pulled away from them again. And uh, Joe Willock is certainly an example of that. You know, he thought he was over all his injury problems and then all of a sudden he's back in the treatment room. You know, it can be a lonely place for footballers when they're in that position. It's their livelihood gets taken away from them and it's difficult and, you know, for Joe Linton, him missing those games at the start of the season, 
Um, I think the, the thigh injury has been a problem all, all year. This one seems more of a freak one. Um, what happened at Sunderland? <clears throat> it was on his standing leg, I think, and then suddenly fell it again. So losing those players, of, of, you know, these are top, top players who bring a lot to the team. Um, it's not like, you know, they're not scoring goals or they're not making assists or winning tackles or winning duels. These are key components to Newcastle's whole philosophy. And um, to be missing even, you know, Willock and Joe Linton is a real tough, uh, real tough blow for Eddie Howe. And one person we haven't spoken about yet is Callum Wilson, Newcastle's number nine. I mean, he's missed a few games in Europe. He's missed the Weir Town derby. I mean, I would have loved to have seen it, the number nine uh, shirt in, in that yeah, one. Yeah. Goodness knows when he'll get another chance to play in that uh, fixture, if at all. How big of a blow is Wilson uh, not being able to play consistently this season being for Newcastle? Yeah, I mean, it, what you can say about Callum Wilson is, is that whenever he plays, he usually scores. He's got an unbelievable goal record for Newcastle. Um, he's desperate to close that gap on Alan Shearer on top of the Premier League goal scoring um, thing. But look, he when he arrived at Newcastle, he had injury issues before. Um, he battled back. And I think he just has to carefully um, almost choose his games. But when he's back and he's playing, he makes an impact. And for me, I think Newcastle could play with strengths even more. Because if you give a player of his calibre in front of goal service, then he repays it every time. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, Callum Wilson. I hope he's back soon. I think it's Aston Villa game. Um, he got mentioned to come back. So, you know, again, another one as quick as possible, get him back on the pitch. And uh, he, he never lets Newcastle down. Do you think um, in the summer league that they'll need to bring in a third striker? I mean, listeners to the podcast know my theory is that I'd go out and get a, a striker as soon as possible to rival both Wilson and he's like effectively replace Wilson as the kind of the number one choice because I just unfortunately don't think you can rely on him. I wouldn't get rid of Wilson. I would look to manage him and you know say to him, you will still feature in 50 and 20 games, but what we're going to do is we're not going to ask you to start those games because unfortunately your body just doesn't hold up. Do you think that's the the will go down, or do you think they'll they'll look to bring in a younger striker, someone they can mould, and just they'll just hope that Wilson can eventually play 36, 38 games um, a, a season? I think every player has to get no. I think Callum Wilson's thirty two now. Um, you are going to be part of squad rotation a, bit, a little bit more. I think even even Alan Shearer found that. I think Bobby. Had him on the bench um, towards the end of his career at Newcastle, and it's just one of them things you can't play. You can't play at full speed forever, basically. So um, players want to play every game. I mean, Callum Wilson last season, I think he came off the pitch a couple of times when he was on two goals, and he was like almost having a little word with Eddie Howe because he was on a hat trick. Um, he's a goal scorer. He wants to be on the pitch as long as possible, um, but you know he's gonna. Play his part as a squad player, potentially moving forward in the, the next couple of seasons. He's done that with England, hasn't he? He's you know he's he's been away with England and he hasn't been the main striker. So it's not something that's going to be a complete surprise to him. But um, I do think they should sign another striker. I agree with you on that because I think another striker just keeps everybody on the toes, gets the fans excited, and. Um, yeah, if they can make a marquee sign in the summer, then they could they could mean business at the business end of the table again. Yeah, well, because goals are what wins wins your games, isn't it? As simple as that. Um, it's it's I, I get it. Look, the, the podcast so far my time a bit uh, down in, in in the domes because we've been speaking about injuries and the poor league form. So let's talk about some positives in league because there have been some standout performers, and we're going to start with Anthony Gordon. I'm a man who, for some reason, Scarf Southgate continues to overlook um, in the England fold, but um, not a person on Tyneside can understand why. He has been absolutely brilliant for Newcastle this season. What have you made of his performances? Yeah, I've been really impressed, um, whether he's been sort of out wide or he's played through the middle a couple of times. Uh, he's really taken on the responsibility. I think last season, you've seen that game against Brentford where he come off and um, 
think he had a little bit of a, not a scuffle, but uh, a bit of a set two with Eddie Howe about being taken off. But since then, he's just been absolutely brilliant. He's been one of Newcastle's star players. I think he's he's desperate to to learn. I think there was a little clip of him on telly the other day, looking back, frustrated at an old clip. And um, for me, a player that can only just continue to get better. And if England don't want to pick him, then you know that keeps him fresh for Newcastle, I guess. Um, but he should be, you know, he should be in and around that squad for the summer. Um, but we know Gareth Southgate has got his favourite players, and you know he was at Newcastle the other day watching. He's not always up here, um, and don't know. He seems to be keen to to stick with the old guard in some ways. But I think Anthony Gordon's international future will sort itself out, and hopefully um, he can go on and be a legend at Newcastle as well. He's certainly going in the right footsteps at Newcastle. Plenty of running, adding goals to his game. I mean, the, the, the goal against Man City was, was absolutely superb. Another man who's also caught the eye is Alexander Izak. He's, you know, he just glides there. I mean, I've seen people, um, you know, put him up there in the bracket of of, of Alan Shearer and, and, and Malcolm McDonald. I don't know if he's quite there yet. I'd like to see another couple of seasons of him, of him con continually banging in the goals for Newcastle. But there's no doubt, and he is a talented, talented striker. Yeah, I mean, I think last season that assist at Everton where he just, you know, waltzed down the left-hand side of the pitch and, you know, put it on a plate for Jacob Murphy. Um, it was a joy to watch that and, a joy to watch it back, but we've had many, many great moments since then. Even when Newcastle have been under pressure, had limited possession, he's still, I mean, PSG is the great example of it. You know, he only got, he knew he was only going to get maybe one chance in that game and he took it. So I think he's a, a player that can, when Newcastle want to be defensive, he's still going to be a threat. Um, but when they start piling forward and we do see them pile forward, um, when Eddie Howe's got all his players available, then uh, he can get a half full of goals as well. So, yeah, I'm totally happy with uh, everything he's brought to the table so far. And he's also another good good guy to talk to. Um, great with interviews. Usually um, stops in the mix zone to talk. And, you know, has really embraced his time at Newcastle so far. And, yeah, he could be another player that could uh, challenge that. Premier League top scorer um, title that Alan Shearer's got. Someone might have to catch him one day. Who's to say it couldn't be Isak? Fingers crossed it would be some uh, some achievements. And we've also seen, Lee, unexpected heroes this season, largely because of that injury crisis Newcastle have had. So players have had to step up to the fold. I want to start with Jamal Lascelles. You know, he's replaced Botman in the time the Dutchman was out injured. And I don't think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll speak for myself, I did not expect Jamal Lascelles to play at that high level that he did do on such a consistent basis to the point where I would be very disappointed if he doesn't get offered a new deal in the summer. I think he's earned it. And those months that he did replace Sven Botman, I thought he was absolutely superb. Yeah, and I think that that comes down to the man management of Eddie Howe because it was in pre-season, and I, I think I've told you this story before, um, we're in a little room at the back of the stand at Philadelphia press conference, and it was Jamal Lascelles put up with uh, Eddie Howe to talk about the American tour. And then at the end, you know, Eddie Howe just grabbed the microphone and said, just to let you know, everyone, Jamal Lascelles is going nowhere. He's going to be the captain. Um, and you could just see Jamal Lascelles was just lifted by that little moment and uh, perfect man management. And Eddie Howe knew he might have to rely on him. He put him in, and yeah, he's been pretty, uh, pretty outstanding in most games. Certainly in Europe, um, he's had a good time there. And you know, last season um, was tough for Jamal Lascelles. I think he only started a handful of Premier League games, and it was difficult for him. And you wondered, you know, does he come back for the for the new season? Well, he's certainly done that. Um, what happens next? You know, contract negotiations were ongoing last time we, we spoke to Eddie Howe about it. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what the next step is for Jamal Lascelles. Yeah, it's been superb, as has Fabian Chair alongside him. But I don't think that was as unexpected as Lascelles' uh, performances this season. 
Lewis Miley is the other name I want to talk about, Lee. I mean, we, we, we talk about being thrown in in the deep end. Lewis Miley's had that experience again. The injuries have forced Eddie Howe to use him. Uh, but look, he's not looked out of place at all. I mean, you, you talk about that Bournemouth game down the south coast when Newcastle were, to put it politely, awful. And he was the one who stood out. And since then, there's been games like that where the team performance has been dreadful. And you know, in the player ratings that you do, Lewis Miley's been given the highest mark, and I don't think anybody would 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 disagree with you because he stood out. And for such a young man to look so so at home in the Premier League, you know, we've got to keep our feet on the ground. But this fella looks like he's got a big future ahead of him. Yeah, I mean, still seventeen years old, um, technically brilliant. Every pass he makes has a purpose. I think he had that pass against Man City down the right-hand side. But Isak, you know, gets on the end of it and forces the keeper into a save. Um, got his first goal. He's got, he had a couple of assists. Even in this bad run, he's looked every inch a Premier League player. He's obviously, playing the Champions League as well, away at PSG, probably one of the best players on the pitch that night. Um, nothing phases him. Seems like he's got his head screwed on, which is great to see. Um, and yeah, he's the scary thing is he's going to get better. The question you've got to ask, because we like to have a little bit of a football debate, was Gareth Southgate watching him the other day? Could could well be, you know. We've seen in the past players go to major tournaments just to get a feel for it. Um, and he's, he's going to be a top player moving forward. I'm sure Gareth Southgate had him on his um, notepad from that game the other night. So, yeah, brilliant bonus for Newcastle. Great for him. I mean, someone his age will normally be going out on loan to League Two, League One. Um, but this guy has everything uh, already, it feels. We don't want to hype him up too much. But even then, he just looks unfazed by absolutely everything so far. Um doesn't seem to have any fear. Long may continue. Yeah, fingers crossed. And it's great to see Newcastle being able to turn to academy uh, products, you know, like Lewis Miley. I mean, one man I feel really sorry for is Elliot Anderson because I think many people expected him to start the season in the uh, first team, given how well he performed in America. He didn't get that opportunity. And you look at it now, given Newcastle's injuries, I mean, he would have been within a shout of, of starting quite a few games and he's picked up this this proper strange injury which has kept him out for so long. I mean, what, what do you think he's thinking at this moment? Yeah, I mean, in America, I watched all the games over there and he was probably the player of that tournament, the Premier League US Series. He was absolutely fantastic. Um the game against Aston Villa, the drew 3-3, three, three, he was brilliant that night. Scored a couple against Brighton. Um, couldn't couldn't fault his contribution uh, to that tournament. And on the back of that, I thought he's just going to be in Eddie Howe's team at the start of the season, and he wasn't. Then he obviously had the injuries. And then he's seen Lewis Miley come from nowhere and get the opportunities he probably would have had. So... I think it'll make him even hungrier. Um, he's had a little taste of an international call-up with Scotland. He's got both England and Scotland interested in him. Um, yeah, the sooner he's back, the better. But he just needs to get his head down, get fit again. And um, I'm sure the rest will come because he's another quality player. And, you know, again, another one who's just unfazed by all the hype around him, all the comments, not bothered goes on the pitch and does a job. So let's hope he can be back uh, soon. And the other one is, is Joe White. You asked uh, Eddie Howe prior to the Man City game about the return of Joe White to Newcastle, returning um, from crew, isn't it, where he's been on loan. I guess, Lee, again, the situation Eddie Howe finds himself in with the injuries probably forces him to take maybe a closer look at Joe White than maybe he would have, would have expected. Um, but, could Joe White maybe even come into the to the, to the thinking over the next few weeks, do you think? Well, I asked Eddie if it was a window of opportunity for Joe White. He said yes. Uh, sadly, he can't play in the FA Cup. 
because he's cup tied. So that's probably a little bit of a blow for him. So the next game he could be available for would be Villa. So his second half of the season hinges on that Villa game. If he comes on, then he can't sign for anybody else. So he would be staying around, I guess. Um, if he doesn't, then I think they'll probably look at another loan for him. But he's got a few training sessions to catch the eye. He's an exciting player. We've both seen him play. We've both seen him come through the ranks. And um, I believe that you know the future can be bright for him as well. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, let's talk then about St. James's Park, Lee. It's a bit of a fortress. Newcastle have lost, of course, to Liverpool, Forest and City, but they've beat Arsenal, they've beat Man United. And you, you would think if they had their full team available, then you know they probably wouldn't have lost to Forest, and and I mean they really shouldn't have lost to City with all uh, due respect. The, the game just gone. Um, what makes St James's Park so special? Well, I think there's been a lot of debate about how the atmosphere could be better, or the atmosphere isn't what it was. It's still pretty good compared to a lot of the Premier League grounds you go to. Um, obviously, you know, back in the entertainers era, the place was absolutely jumping. Um, and I don't think those heights have ever been recaptured. Lots of different reasons for that. Um, you know, all see a stadium for a start. Um, you've got technology now, people with mobile phones, um, there's other distractions, but I think nine times out of ten. Um, the PSG game was fantastic. You know, Chelsea as well, hammered Chelsea. The Arsenal game, Man United game. I think the crowd do whip up a big atmosphere. Um, could there be a singing section? I think that would be good moving forward um, if they can do that. Certainly can't fault the, the, the displays, but um, it's still a fortress and there's still some big games to come at St. James Park and the crowd always play their part home and away. But hopefully, um, second half of the season, they can really roll them on to uh, get into Europe again. That would be, that'd be very nice indeed. Certainly would. And I want to just quickly talk about Europe. I mean, you were across uh, in Paris, Germany and Italy following Newcastle United. I was looking enough to, to be in Dortmund as well. Absolutely fantastic, fantac- fantastic atmosphere. Uh, we'll, we'll focus, though, firstly, actually on the football, on the results. I mean... Let's be honest, Newcastle still should be in the Champions League, really, shouldn't they? If that travesty in Paris hadn't happened, we would be talking about um, you know, the, the next round of games for Newcastle and in Europe's elite competition. Yeah, well, it was all going so well, wasn't it? You know, nil-nil against AC Milan. Really good point. Um, absolutely hammered PSG 4-1. One of the best nights I've ever had watching Newcastle. Pretty sure it was the same for you. Um, and then it was that... The Dortmund games, they were the, the reality check. Um, they were a bit unlucky at home, the Dortmund, really. Could have easily got a point. I think they hit the crossbar a couple of times. Um, I mean, away from home against Dortmund, you know, you can't really argue with what happened. Newcastle's weren't weren't up to the task on the night. Um, then PSG away, you're just hoping they can hold on for that vital win. And it would have really lifted them going in the last game against Milan. But look, it was still all to play for against AC Milan at home. Um, one nil up, still on course. And then disaster strikes and Newcastle not only go out of the Champions League, but also miss out on the Europa League. So I couldn't quite believe it that night, to be totally honest. Um, I think the, the needed to be a way where Newcastle we were able to still push on an attack and try and get through the Champions League, but also make sure to keep it tight because we, if we'd got in the Europa League now, it, again, it would be another competition to look forward to. They don't have that now. So that was the biggest disappointment for me that they missed out altogether and finished that night empty-handed. Hmm. I mean, but the experience that the players will take away from the campaign, I mean, only a couple of them had ever, you know, uh, experienced Champions League football uh, before. It, it's a big learning curve. It came ahead of time. But as you mentioned earlier, it gives you the taste of, of, of hopefully of, of what's to come. And, you know, despite going out of the competition in, in disappointing circumstances, 
plenty of positives to take and let's like say not least the the, the learn the learning curve they'll take from it yeah i think it was a learning curve for the players the club for the fans being back in europe um obviously there were some difficulties on some away games with with um opposing fans so it was just a little taste of it again because there's a certain generation of fans did actually that was their first taste of it so you know i've i've still got memories of going to a place like monaco and mets in uh, in the 90s and you know they didn't win either of those games away from home you absolutely trounced at monaco but I still talk about that game with, with some of my friends. So it's good that the fans have at least had that. Um, and yeah, as I was saying earlier, to be in Europe, it's it can be tough on, on the Thursday nights, but when the draw's being made and people are booking flights and hotels, I think it's something that all the fan base looks forward to. So and it's just adding, adding some um, different stadiums on the bucket list as well. So for me... If Newcastle got in the, even the Europa Conference League, I think we'd all we we might fear that it could be fi a fixture congestion, but I think we'd all privately look forward to you know when the draws made, who they could get, and where he could be going as a fan. So I think I, it's important. Yeah, definitely one hundred percent. I mean, there was a silly <clears> debate <throat> um, uh, before that the last game against. Uh, Milan was whether you know you want to go out of the Europe altogether or you'd want to drop into the Europa League if that's what was on offer. And I couldn't understand why people were asking that question. Of course, you'd want to stay in Europe because long term, again, it builds that experience. So when the Champions League comes back around, the players who are still here at Newcastle will have that experience of playing week in, week out, you know, uh, Saturday, Wednesday, Sunday, Tuesday, whatever. And um, they'll be used to that schedule, but um, it wasn't to be. Before I ask you later to kind of predict what comes next in the next uh, few months to, to the end of the season, just tell our listeners about what it's been like to cover Newcastle United this season. Has there been any real changes, I guess, going away and covering them in Europe is, is, is probably one that stands out, but I don't know if you want to share anything about what it's been like to, to follow Newcastle home and away. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been great, really. I mean, it's been, games come thick and fast, really. I mean, from Milan away, you know, those five Champions League games just seem to be over a flash. Um, but you, when one game's finished, you're already looking to the next. You're, you're already looking forward to the next away game. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got Fulham coming up away in the Cup. So that's going to be interesting to see 4,000 fans go down there on a Saturday night. Um, some of them might end up stranded down there, but they'll be determined to make a noise get behind the team um but covering them has been probably as enjoyable now as, as it's ever been really because you've had the, the advent of being in europe um you know those games you were in dortmund you seen what it was like there it was just a complete jolly takeover really wasn't it um had the big stage up and paris you know that was it, it was difficult i guess because the fans were kind of being moved around a bit by by the police um, in Milan, when they took over the canal area of Milan, that was fantastic as well. Um, nicer weather then as as well. So it, it's been good. Um, I mean, the results could have been better. Obviously, that would be nice. But um, I just feel that there's still so much to play for this season, and hopefully um, they can they can get something. But there's there's been a lot of highlights. I mean, I haven't, I haven't even mentioned Manchester United away there. In the Carabao Cup, three 0 at Man United. Never had it any better. So um, I enjoyed that one as well. Beating Man City um, at home, St James Park, another highlight. So even for all the doom and gloom, you could probably write about 10, 10 highlights on a, on a piece of paper there. So hopefully, there's more to come. Yeah, fingers crossed. Crossed. And what is to come then? What do we think Newcastle can achieve? in the second half of the season, uh, hopefully a trip to Wembley maybe in the FA Cup and maybe even uh, qualification uh, to the Europa League. It would be my uh, pick, but what about yourself, Lee? Well, obviously the FA Cup is something we'd love to see Newcastle finally win after all these years. Um, never in our lifetime has it happened, um, lifting the trophy at, at Wembley. So that would be... Brilliant. I think they've got a tough game at Fulham, but 
you like to think if they can't beat Fulham, then um, we are, we must be due a good draw in one of the cups at home. Let's get a home tie. Let's get a less Dalton fixture. And then, you know, if they can get the quarterfinals, suddenly you're only one step away from going to Wembley anyway for a semi-final. So that would be magnificent. Um, for me, the FA Cup, I'm still a big fan of it. I watched Bristol City against West Ham last night. Magic of the Cup, low league team beating one of the one of the big guns. So I'm still a fan of it. FA Cup, I think it's important. And that would be a great first trophy for Newcastle to win anyway. Um, the European side of it, again, but I'd be... I would accept the Europa Conference League place. I think that would be quirky. Be interesting for Newcastle. Um, Jose Mourinho won it with Roma. So it's still something worth winning. Um, he made no bones about that when he was lifting the trophy. So there's, there's plenty of um, things that Newcastle can still get from this season. But at the minute, it's just about turning things around, stopping the rot, you know, maybe getting a lucky win where they get a scrappy goal. Um, and it's amazing how once once your luck turns, it's suddenly going in the other direction, and then all of a sudden you, you seem to be getting the rub of the green. You don't even seem to notice it as much when it's going well. When it's not going well, it just feels like another kick in the teeth every time something bad happens. Um, so hopefully we can just get back to winning ways. There's plenty, plenty still to play for, still half a season left. Let's hope... Um, Let's hope by the end of the season we've got something to shout about. Fingers crossed and hopefully the first victory comes against Fulham and Newcastle can progress into the FA Cup and get the ball rolling for some positive results with Villa and those uh, other teams on the agenda. Thanks to Lee for popping on to the Everything is Black and White podcast. You guys watching and listen, hit follow, hit subscribe, share the episode and head over to chroniclelive.co.uk where you can keep up to date with all the latest Newcastle news including a dedicated transfer live blog for myself and Lee. We'll see you guys very soon.